Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Polls show that Barack Obama won almost 80% of the Jewish vote in the presidential election. This despite a smear campaign waged against him, mostly around the issue of security for Israel. On this edition of Independent Sources, we focus on what's being reported in the Jewish media about the state of black Jewish relations and what Jews in the U.S. and in Israel are saying about Obama's approach to problems in the Middle East. We visit two companies who put their imprint on the ethnic press. We profile a newspaper that embraces a new generation of Indian Americans. And we go to the IPIs, where the best of ethnic and community media is recognized. Recently, Vianora Venka and I talked with J.J. Goldberg of The Forward and Dennis Raps of the Jewish Press about the Obama victory, the relationship between blacks and Jews, and the president-elect's policy towards Israel. Dennis Raps, before the election, certain Jewish Orthodox uh, websites posted um, racial comments and speculations about Obama, and the Jewish press picked up on them and criticized them. Now, Obama chose as chief of staff Ram Emanuel, who uh, is a member of the um, Orthodox uh, synagogue, and his father um, is known for fighting uh, in the Irgun. Has this changed sentiment at all? Well, I think people who uh, initially uh, um, uh, express themselves, as you described, um, I think are not going to listen, are not going to take notice of anything that, that's going to disabuse them of that notion. Uh, I think there was so much uh, vituperation and so much uh, mindless uh, uh, speculation that it was, uh, you know, you can't expect uh, um, uh, Anything, even the appointment of somebody who was so uh, so closely identified with the uh, Jewish community, or Orthodox community, as it were, uh, but more importantly, the Jewish community. Um, it, it I don't think it makes it made any difference with those folks. I think it re re reassured a lot of people that um, the kinds of things that the, the, the concerns that they had um, uh, were. Uh, I don't know if they were unfounded, but uh, to this at this point, but uh, the concerns are. Uh, pushed back because uh, now we have a, an opportunity to see how things are going to develop. What are some of these concerns that the uh, Orthodox Jewish or some factions in that community had about Obama? Well, I think, I think um, the, the issue was not so much with Obama. The, mm -hmm. the issue was with the Democrats. Um, the, 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 uh, at least the, the editorial positions that we took uh, were very similar to those that we took when, uh, when uh, John Kerry ran. Uh, it's the this notion of um, um, the even-handedness um, and all that went with that notion uh, between Israel and the and the Palestinians. Uh, we felt that uh, uh, that uh, well, when uh, John Kerry ran, he talked about being an honest broker and even-handedness, and we feel that that um, uh, that that doesn't go far enough. Okay. We believe that it's in Americans, America's interest and in Israel's interest in order to be able to defend itself that uh, 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 there be the special relationship uh, okay. that uh, Israel has had with the United States uh, for, for many years. Okay. Uh, JJ, let's talk about, let's change the subject a little bit from uh, black and Jewish relationship. Uh, your paper recently uh, published an article where it says that the uh, whole ties may have been renewed between blacks and Jews. First of all, uh, what happened to that special relationship that blacks and Jews in this country had during the civil rights movement? And do you see the Obama election as basically a lasting or a temporary renewed of these ties? I think what happened in the late 60s and through into the 70s was that the leaderships of the two communities um, parted ways mainly on the issue of affirmative action. That um, when Jews hear the word quotas or uh, special privileges for a group based on its identity, they think of the experience Jews have had throughout history of being excluded based on numbers. And so there's an instinctive unwillingness to support that. Um, with the black community, there was a sense that um, the civil rights revolution hadn't gone far enough. It opened up the doors but it didn't give people the uh, help they needed after all those years of discrimination to get through the doors. Uh, it reached a peak with the Backey case before the Supreme Court when all of the major black organizations were lined up on one side of the case and all of the major Jewish organizations were lined up on the other. 
and there was a sense on each side that they hadn't realized how far the other one had wandered. Okay. Um, it went on because of the Jesse Jackson campaigns for president. He was, um, he was critical of Israel. There was a sense that the leadership of the black community was uh, more and more identified with colonized and oppressed peoples around the world, which translates into the third world, which in many Jewish years translates into um, the Arabs and uh, danger to Israel. Okay. So that a lot of perceptions were going on on both sides. Frequently the, the people who are the most vocal in one community don't necessarily represent that community, but that's who the other side hears, and it goes both ways. And uh, where do we stand now? Do you think moving forward this will be a renewal of the ties or sort of like a temporary moment? I don't know that there's a renewal of the ties. There was an actual alliance for many, many years where the major black and Jewish organizations were leading a fight to end discrimination on the basis of race and religion. It was very much a mutual help um, alliance. And um, now it's a matter of sentiment more than anything else. I think when the Jewish community came out 78%, I think it was, for Obama, that was, it, in one stroke, it wiped away all the perceptions of the Jewish community as having lost sympathy with the black community. And having a, um, uh, a black leader, a, uh, an African-American who was not identified with black nationalism or with um, anger, but with simply being the best American, it wiped away a lot of illusions. Each side saw, first of all, its own leadership, to some extent stripped bare, and the other side's leadership discredited. And there was a sense that the people on the ground who really do sympathize with each other and do have common cause saw each other for the first time in years. I just, just to add to that, I think, uh, you know, it, it was really interesting to me that uh, when everybody was saying uh, the, the, the conflict between the two groups, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I think this election showed that uh, party affiliation uh, was stronger than any, uh, any issue of race. And, and JJ, have you been monitoring the uh, media coverage of the election in Israel? Yes. What has been the uh, uh, reaction there to the Obama win? It's the media coverage in Israel is written by reporters, and the uh, intellectual class, the, um, the uh, writing, the scribblers, the chattering classes are very, very excited by the Obama victory. There's a real sense of hope that change is possible and that new winds can blow through. There's a great feeling in Israel of being stuck um, in this cycle, um, and the hope that some new approach will shake things up not, on, not only in America but around the world and perhaps he can actually be the broker. He might be an inspiration to a new generation of Israeli leadership. Among the general population there's a sense of loss I think. Uh, there's a fear that the even-handedness that Dennis was talking about may come to replace uh, the special relationship. There's a, a sense among many people in Israel, not necessarily among the leadership but certainly on the, uh, the average Joe or the average Yossi, that um, that Republicans are for a strong arm. Um, Democrats want to resolve conflicts and Republicans want to win them. And uh, in Israel that rings very strong. Just to add to that, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that um, a good portion of the Israeli population, uh, particularly in our constituency, uh, the, the more uh, religious uh, um, uh, groupings, uh, are interested in, in basically non-intervention. They would prefer that, that uh, an Obama administration um, just facilitate, but not to offer ideas or, or to intervene into the process uh, on the theory that, uh, which is something that, that we share, is that the, on the theory that only the parties can work this out and anything that's inserted or, um, or introduced by an outside party doesn't allow the natural uh, balance to, f to, to, to develop and that can have a long-term um, uh, uh, success. But sometimes, don't you need a mediator in a, in a conflict? And couldn't uh, the American presidency, would be Obama or even Bush, play a mediator role? Especially th now with the Iran and the common interest well, see, that you might see. I think, I think the, the, to go back to the uh, Clinton administration, when at the end, um, what was going on was, um, uh, I think, the Palestinian side relying on the intervention of the United States and not having to face 
the music, as it were. Uh, you agree, Jay, yeah? Well, the Palestinian side was very bitter at the end of the Clinton administration because they'd been hoping for something resembling even-handedness, and the Clinton administration ended up being seen by the Palestinian leadership as uh, solidly and irreconcilably pro-Israel. Uh, I think the difference is that Israel is very evenly decided, uh, divided, like America, between those who want to make a compromise deal with the Palestinians. Um, Rabin had a vision of settling the Palestinian conflict on some basis, on the assumption that the Palestinians don't represent a real threat to Israel. They have no military power. Um, and that will bring the rest of the uh, Arab states around Israel into line. It'll remove the barrier for them, the emotional barrier of making peace with Israel. And then Iran becomes isolated in the region rather than Israel. Um, the other side of the argument in Israel is that Israel won't be safe without the West Bank. And um, anything, a deal with the Palestinians inevitably means giving up the West Bank. And any pressure to reach a deal means pressure to give up the West Bank. So that stalling um, any way you can, then you get to hold on to the West Bank. And that's all the time we have for, unfortunately, J.J. Goldberg and Dennis Raps. Thank you for coming in. Now here's Thanks, Abby Ishola with some other news. Thanks, Vianor. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic media. From India West, Pakistani native Javad Iqbal is suing the U.S. government for false imprisonment following 9-11. He claims he was tortured while in custody at a detention center in Brooklyn for over two years. Iqbal was never found guilty of any terrorist activity. New America Media reports that many detained immigrants have been quietly sent back to their homelands after signing away their rights. Within the past four years, nearly 100,000 immigrants were deported under a federal government program called Stipulated Removal. Many had no legal representation and were forced to sign documents that allowed officials to remove them immediately. Several undocumented immigrants are being held in the U.S. after immigration officials raided the agri-processor Kosher Slaughterhouse in Iowa. The Jewish Forward reports that a judge ordered the men to testify against their former supervisors, but didn't provide them with financial support. A Catholic church is currently taking care of them. From Caribbean Life, City Council member Kendall Stewart is pushing a new bill that will allow non-citizens to become police officers or firefighters if they've served in the U.S. military. From the Amsterdam News, Dora Berksteiner, president of the Staten Island African American Political Association, is looking to get more blacks involved in politics in the area. No African American has ever been elected to a political office on Staten Island. The borough has a black population of less than 10 percent. And finally, from News India Times, India ranks among the top 25 countries in women's political empowerment. This according to the World Economic Forum's 2008 Global Gender Gap Report. The ranking was determined by the difference between the number of male and female political decision makers at the highest level. Those were just a few headlines from New York's Ethnic Media. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Abby. The printing press has been around since Johann Gutenberg invented the machine in the 15th century. But the fact is, Gutenberg's press was modeled on technologies developed centuries before in ancient China. Today, there are new technologies for publishing. Still, most of New York's ethnic and immigrant media turn out newspapers the old-fashioned way. Michelle Garcia reports on two companies where the presses haven't stopped. Downtown Manhattan, circa 2008. New York City, circa 1900. It was known as Printing House Square down here, Newspaper Row, they called it. They were the titans, but they weren't alone. In the 1920s, just about all communities and immigrant groups could lay claim to their own newspaper. And the automation revolution in the 1960s and 70s priced out the city's small and diverse papers from the printing business. To survive, the immigrant and ethnic papers had to adapt by turning to small, independent printers. Well, they all started from Chinese daily newspapers, and they just had presses with nothing to do, and from there we developed a, a commercial shop. There were non-union shops, it was very easy for them to do it. My name is Ken Aculin, we're at Stella Printing, and what are we doing here? We're, uh, we are newspaper printers. We're, we're not just printers, we print newspapers, only newspapers. We don't print name cards, we don't print uh, wedding invitations, we, don't, we print newspapers. We're newspaper men. We're in one of the last outposts of industrial New York, 
Long Island City, Queens, and the home base of stellar printers for the last 20 years. Ken Ackerlin is one of a handful of small printers still working the presses of the industrial age, thanks largely to New York's immigrant and ethnic presses. You can now have an affiliate overseas send you information, and you can start a newspaper with very little capital. All you need is a printer who'll print it, a friend in Russia who'll send you the information, and the ability to go around and pick up advertising in a, a van or a, a station wagon to deliver it, and you got a newspaper. Right there, we have one just came from China, I believe, the Global Digest. We speak them on the phone, we, have, we never see them. It's very rare that we see some of the customers. We have files coming from Israel, we have some from Turkey, we have some from Romania, uh, from Pakistan also. Pretty much throughout the Middle East, Africa, so we have some coming from Africa. Too. But when the presses roll for papers from Beijing to Budapest, there's just one crucial detail the printers must keep in mind. Page numbers. That's very important, page numbers. <laughs> and that's all we really look at. And we have to know whether it reads from the front to the back or the back to the front. And have some good idea of whether something's upside down. The global marketplace isn't only making demands on small printers. Big printers are bending to new currents in the marketplace. In Whitestone, one of the city's largest newspapers serving the Chinese and Taiwanese-born communities has from its birth in 1976 printed its own paper. We're inside the World Journal. Edwin Ling oversees the operations for this massive newspaper. He says farming the job out would just put them behind the curve. If we don't have our own press machine, they cannot read the newspaper right away. So you're in control? Uh, yeah. You yeah. get to control? Yeah, we got control ourselves. We don't want to send other uh, printing shop. We can kind of control the time. So that's the most important thing. New software introduced in 2002 allowed for the World Journal to join the rising tide of papers that changed from a vertical print to horizontal. We did change. Before, we read by a straight line. Then we changed to... Uh, You're horizontal now. Yeah, horizontal. Yeah, right, right, right. Now, he says, it's easy to print words in English, words that are part of their daily lives and meet the demands of business. Some of our uh, advertising custom, customers, they don't read Chinese. So we have to show them that's the uh, consumer news. Newspaper printing still relies on heavy, stiff machines. But the people behind the controls have to be nimble if they want to stay in the black. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. We'll be right back. Journalism is about telling stories true stories about real people. And in my experience, real life is far more compelling than fiction. I'm Linda Proud, and I've been a journalist for 25 years and a teacher of journalism for 16. There are many ways to tell a story. I started in radio, moved to television, then to print, but I was drawn back to broadcasting. Maybe that's because I come from a tradition of oral storytelling. I've traveled and worked all over the world, and similar traditions exist everywhere people passing on stories about the events of the day, about events in their lives. And that's what broadcast journalism does, albeit in a more structured way. Radio is still how many people first learn about the stories of the day, whether it's a New Yorker tuning into all news radio, or a farmer in Haiti who has access to news only via radio. Combine images with the spoken word, and television can sometimes transcend language and cultural barriers. So I teach students to write stories, and the operative word is write. Write stories that truly and clearly speak to people, whether the story has the brevity of breaking news or the depth of a documentary. You'll learn this at the CUNY J School from experienced professors and from professionals from the industry. And you'll learn this in New York, home to dozens of commercial, community, and cable stations. So if you're serious about broadcast journalism, this should speak to you. Papers that have served immigrant communities are going through a process of reinvention. Their new readers often identified as Americans or are indeed Americans, born and raised in this country. News India Times has recognized the change in readership and found ways to adapt. Leonora Venka filed this report. If you were to look at the real 
role of ethnic papers in communities? What is it? It's not only giving community news. If you look at any paper, they are more of advocates of the communities rather than really newspapers. And my publisher particularly, he's in, he has always been an advocate of the populations that he writes for, so much so that he's, that's, he's known for that. The publisher of News India Times, Gopal Raju, is known in the community for having launched the first and what was to become the largest circulated Indian American publication in the United States, India Abroad. After running it for several decades, Raju sold India Abroad in 2001 to another Indian company. He then launched News India Times and currently publishes several publications catering to the South Asian community, including Desi Talk and Gujarat Times. Veena Merchant, who's been working with Raju since the 1970s, describes how the paper's content changed over time. The immigration laws during the early 60s changed, and they changed to bring in people who were qualified, educated people. So during that time, a lot of Indians came here, engineers, doctors, scientists. And there was no media, no Indian media that they could look at. They were all nostalgic. They needed news from their home. 70 to 80 percent of the news was from India, because that's what the necessity of the market was at that point. Now. We are almost into second generation. That generation has a different identity. They have an Indian-American identity. The profile of the kind of news that we give is changing completely. Our basic focus is on news about Indian-Americans living in the United States. It is hard news concerning the community and features stories about successful Indian-Americans. The goal of News India Times, Raju told independent sources, is to highlight the accomplishments of the Indian American community and its contribution to the American economy. It is also to encourage the community to take an active role at the policy making level in all walks of life. On the issue of mainstream media companies gaining interest in the audiences of well established ethnic publications and seeking to buy the papers out, Veena Merchant had this to say. It would kill me to think that my paper would be bought by a large company. At the same time, I'm getting old, so is my publisher. So it's very tempting to say, okay, let's sell to a large company. But Veena Merchant also believes that a mainstream company would not cater to the Indian American community the ways in which News India Times does. Why would a mainstream person who buys it have any advocacy in their minds at all? Why should they? I mean, I'm not faulting them, but they would buy it as a business proposition and the advocacy issues would have very little meaning. There is really only one boy. One girl. One tree. One forest. One deep dancing ocean. One mountain calling. One handful of sand through our fingers. One endless sky overhead. And one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. We end our show with a celebration of achievement. Each year, the New York Community Media Alliance honors journalists who have done outstanding work covering their communities. The award ceremony is called the Ippies, and Independent Sources was there. And Jeanette Levert has the story. On a new law proposed by Congress to curb radical movements in the U.S. and its underlying threats to activist freedom of speech. It's the 2008 Ippies. Hosted by the New York Community Media Alliance, this annual awards center recognizes excellence in journalism, design, and photography by New York's immigrant and ethnic media. We want to 
bring home each and every time, you know, to the journalists that are doing this work, how important their work is. Awards were given in several editorial categories for achievements in visual journalism. And there were many winners. Dominating the awards this year were The Independent, The Ford, and CityLimits.org. City Limits took home six awards this year for coverage on a broad range of topics, from an expose on shoddy housing to a story on the use of hand scans to punch the time clock. We do cover a lot of different things, and the um, sort of rubric um, that connects them all is it's news affecting uh, the other New York, lower income New Yorkers, um, has to do with social justice. So um, our roots are really in affordable housing, and we do a lot of that. Um, and you'll find that at our website uh, most, most of the time. But so that uh, news affecting lower income New Yorkers also includes labor issues and immigration issues and welfare, child welfare, i.e. foster care, um, uh, you know, a lot of things. So we kind of feel like our, our, area, our coverage area is sort of uh, narrow and broad at the same time. This year, three keynote speakers made their way to the podium. New York City Comptroller William C. Thompson, Jr., New York Times National Correspondent Julia Preston, and CUNY journalism professor Lonnie Isabel. New this year was the presentation of three special awards for excellence in justice and community reporting. They were created through the partnership between John Jay College Center on Media, Crime, and Justice and the New York Community Media Alliance. I profited a lot from uh, fellowships that I was granted by this organization. Um, I, when I came to New York, I was really, I wasn't a reporter at all, actually. I, I just came after graduating in my country, so I, I really learned through those fellowships uh, the craft of reporting. Reporting worthy of recognition. And Jeanette Levert for Independent Sources. That's our show. Thanks for watching and join us next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.